Okay, so we left off talking about the various documents leading up to um, the actual push for the American Revolution. We've talked about Thomas Paine's common sense and how it pushes some of the people in the middle to join the war effort um, and declare their independence and fight the British, as well as it kind of sets up the ideals of a Republican government. Um, and then we see the Declaration of Independence becomes kind of our confirmation of those ideas, because if not, we're just in open rebellion. And then we see the disbursement and the anger towards loyalists, as we can see in this video and so forth, and we're just going to move on from there. So as basically the British are getting moved away from Boston, because as we mentioned, Boston is a strong stronghold of the Patriots. So they started moving their, their views and their strategy southward towards New York as their base of operations. So they're going to see a large feet, fleet going in with a massive amount of ships, around 500 ships and 35,000 men. As we mentioned, this is the largest navy in the world at this point, um, being an island nation that's very important. Um, at that point, we don't have very many troops, um, and they're very ill-trained at that point. So we're going to see that Washington's kind of set with a lot of um, hindrances on his growth and so forth, um, and they're going to pretty much be losing early on at this point. Um, he's going to leave and escape from Manhattan Island, uh, battle Long Island as well, crosses Hudson Riz Ri River and seeks refuge eventually in New Jersey, um, and eventually gets to the Delaware River, and then he's got some British basically trailing him very closely. Eventually, he crosses the Delaware River um, on a cold December 26 morning, late or early that morning, surprised and captures about 900 to 1,000 Hessians who had been sleeping off, apparently, a Christmas Day celebration. So he sneaks up on them. Um, and the way he did it is basically his, his tactics at this point are surprise and sneaking up on his enemy. Um, he then left his campfires burning basically to sl slip away and sends in for an attachment at Princeton. So Trenton and Princeton become kind of victories for him, um, and we're going to see that that's kind of some of the, you know, gets the morale of the, of the American troops growing at this point. Um, but at that point, we still haven't won, um, and we're going to move forward from there. And here's the famous painting of uh, General George Washington crossing the Delaware um, there's a lot of actual inaccuracies in it. Um, it's pretty anachronistic for the fact that apparently, um, if we look and zoom in, this was apparently not our flag at the time. Um, in the background, there's some horses kind of sitting in canoes. We've got Washington um, standing up, which would be a very, very bad decision for your commander-in-chief to be doing. Um, and in the manner he's standing, he probably wouldn't be able to do that. Um, it's a small boat. Um, there's an African-American slightly to his right below him. Um, and it's also lit up, and more than likely this happened very, very early in the morning, um, and it was still dark, so there's a lot of inaccuracies there. Okay, so the British come up with a plan to basically try and cut off um, a lot of New England and some various areas, and so this was going to be kind of a, a, a kind of a constricting plan, where you'd have General Burgoyne coming from the northern part from Canada and meeting up with General Howe's troops from New York. They're supposed to meet around Albany, um, and there's just supposed to be a third party kind of meeting up as well. Um, and this kind of all falls apart. But what's going to happen eventually is going to be that Burgoyne's troops are going to be surrounded, um, and we're going to talk about that and how he basically gets picked off because um, General Howe's troops never actually make it to their location on time. So as I mentioned before, the things kind of start falling apart. Um, Washington and his troops finally retire Unfortunately, in the winter at Valley Forge, where they're going to lose a lot of men due to the conditions that they're experiencing there, um, luckily the drill sergeant or drill master, Baron von Steuben, steps in and starts giving the troops a little bit more discipline so that they'll be better prepared when they actually go fight in pitched battles. Um, and then we have one of the most important battles of the American Revolution is the Battle of Saratoga. So in October of 1777, um, Burgoyne and his men are basically taken um, suffering a huge defeat, but the point of this is it's a huge turning point and consider one of the most decisive battles for the fact that after this, France senses that we're going to actually win this thing, and they're more willing to openly and officially help America. So now we'll have aid in the form of resources and troops, as well as a navy that will help supply us and support us. So now um, England will be fly fighting not just um, the American colonists, but also France, and then later Spain will join in as well as an ally to France. 
And so all this is going on, we're trying to entice the French prior to this to joining in. So we sent a group of delegates to France. One of the lead roles that we'll see played here is by Benjamin Franklin as a diplomat selling um, this idea of America. And so after the humiliation, as it mentions here at Saratoga, um, the British offered the Americans a measure that gave them home rule, but we didn't want that. We wanted um, independence. Um, everything they wanted except independence, basically. So after Saratoga, finally, we have the French on our side, um, and they're going to come to our aid um, and form a formal American you know, treaty with us. So in 1778, Treaty of Alliance, offering America everything that Britain had offered, plus recognition of independence. So we take them on. Even though we're not best friends, we both have the enemy of the British. So as I alluded to before, in 1779, Spain and Holland entered the war against the British. So pretty much everybody is on the side of us. Um, then you have the arm neutrality, which means nothing pretty much. Just don't worry about that. Um, as it's dragging on, though, we're not doing as well. Um, but once this aid starts slowly trickling in, we're going to start noticing some motivation and some growth by our military. And eventually some victories are going to start mounting up. But we'll go through some rough times, just like in Valley Forge, where we suffered some losses. We're also going to suffer some losses in the 1780s due to the fact of a poorly resourced military um, and no money. That's going to be a problem, too, for us paying our troops. As I mentioned about that low point in 1780, eventually the French do show up. Um, Comte de Rochambeau becomes one of those people, but there's going to be a little bit of tension between the American and French and who's kind of in charge and all that kind of stuff and taking orders from a foreigner. Um, also, we have the occasion where Benedict Arnold basically sells out the idea of West Point um, for money. Um, he's going to flee to British and then we pretty much see that things are kind of bad in the South. Georgia's going to be overrun in 1778-79, mainly because these are, these are loyalist strongholds. So Charleston falls as well right after that. Um, but they're going to have some difficulties fighting on the interior. Um, one battle will be the Battle of Cowpens, um, where the Americans actually win. And one of the tactics we use is going to be used by Nathaniel Green, which is basically attack and then retreat and hope that they get sucked into the interior so deeply that they run out of resources and their supply lines get cut off. Okay, we have this period known as the Bloody Year on the Frontier, um, where Native Americans that fought on the side of the British basically go on a killing spree and scalping and so forth. Um, that's going to kind of hurt our morale. we got Mohawk Chief Joseph Brandt, who had apparently recently converted to Anglicanism. Um, use this as a battle tactic on the frontier of Pennsylvania and New York. Um, you got the pro-British Iroquois at this point also signed a treaty with the British, um, actually between the United States and then Indian Nation. So things are kind of deteriorating. It looks like a bad period. But then luckily George Rogers Clark's, George Rogers Clark um, does really well on the frontier basically with a kind of pseudo-navy. Um, making several efforts and several victor victories on the very interior, um, which mounts for several victories or battles that we start winning. And as you kind of see or should notice that the more interior the British go, the more uh, losses that they keep gaining or getting. I don't know. How to we get more victories, they get more losses. Okay, and then luckily the final victory for the Americans is going to be at the Battle of Yorktown. Um, so Cornwallis gets put into a trap, basically. He tries to retreat back to the coastline where he can think he can receive resources um, and more British people to help control, or to actually resource him and help him out. Um, he gets trapped by Washington's army as they head south from New York, and as well as Rochambeau's armies also coming in. And then the French Navy steps in to basically close them in, um, and then Cornwallis is going to be defeated, and basically this is the end of the war. Um, some people still fought, wanted to keep fighting the war, but most people call this the closing curtain of the, the last battle or major defeat for the British, which ends the American Revolution. Okay, after every major war, you're going to have a situation where you have to sit down at a table and negotiate. Um, we do really well with this. We send three major leaders for this envoy, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay. They're going to be the ones settling this peace treaty in 1783 in Paris. Um, so Jay, apparently suspecting that France would try to keep the United States cooped up on the east um, in the American week. So what he does is he goes and basically barters and talks to the other side. 
So the outcome of this is what you just really need to understand is the Treaty of Paris of 1783. We get formally recognized as an independent state. We have a large bounce of this area that we're going to have from the Mississippi River um, to the Great Lakes in the north and Spanish Florida in the south. Um, also, part of this is going to be that we're not supposed to persecute any loyalists after this war. Anybody that wants to come back should be able to return, basically, um, and be compensated. So they're not going to suffer for going to the other side, and we get pretty much a good generous amount of land and also the thing that we wanted the most at this point our freedom and independence, but they do retain some fisheries at this point up in the north part of Canada. And as you can tell here, the more darker brown is going to be the territory that we gained from this treaty in 1783. Prior to that, to the right, and the more mustardish yellow color was what we had prior to the American Revolution. Um, and then that proclamation line of 1763 that really ticked us off right after the French and Indian War.